<laughs> Did you find something? Oops. Damn it. No, don't put milk in my tea. It's disgusting. Welcome to Kuvulu, the sorcery of copper. In this episode we'll talk about the grill bomb. This is a device I've built for the bachelor party of a friend. And what it is, is actually a diffusing game. Now, let me switch it on. And, as you can see, the, the countdown has started. He now has 10 minutes to diffuse the bomb. And for that he has a pair of pliers and this sheet. On this sheet, there are four puzzles. And if you solve the puzzle correctly, then it would give you the color of the cable you had to cut. But to solve the puzzle, he needed to know a couple of details about his future wife. Now, let's solve it and diffuse it correctly. Like here, diffuse correctly, good. And what it does actually is it, it enables this torch and this torch would grill the piece of meat on the back. Let's put back the flame. So this is if he would win the game and it would also announce, announce the barbecue and we could enjoy the rest of the day. Now, on the other hand, let me restart the game. If he would have lost, then what happens is that the syringe would inject the deadly poison within the piece of meat. I'll just demonstrate it as you can see here. Then the piece of meat would be poisoned and he wouldn't be allowed to eat anything for the rest of the day. Now, this game was a huge success. He did make one mistake, but he managed to defuse the game in time, and actually only three seconds were remaining. And up to now, they're still married. And this was the opportunity for me to learn how to drive motors. So let's have a look. Let's start with the simplest of them all, the DC motor. Here's one of them, and you can recognize it because it only has two pins. And if you measure what's on the two pins, you can see that it has a couple of ohms on them, or a couple of tens of ohms. And this is because this is just the coil which is inside which you measure. So it behaves like a passive. There's only a, a coil inside here. No fancy electronics. Here we have another DC motor and on top of it we have a weight. This weight is actually used to generate vibration, but in our case it will help us to see the motor spinning. So, to control the motor or to start it, all you need is to provide some voltage. And if you want it to spin faster, you increase the voltage. The current defines how strong it can turn. If I block it, you can see it tries to turn it with a more, bit more force and uses more current. There's always a limit to it, but the voltage is the, about the speed, the current is about the force. And if you want it to turn the other way around, what you do is just inverse the polarity. And in this case, it turns the other way around. Pretty simple to drive. You don't connect the motor directly to the pins of the microcontroller because this will not be able to provide enough current for it to spin. This is why we have transistors. The microcontroller will control the transistor and the transistor will provide or cut the power to the motor. Now one transistor would be enough if you just want it to spin. But what you generally do is use four transistors and this allows you to have it either spin in one direction, spin the other direction or have a fast or slow decay depending on which transistor you enable and on the configuration. Now, this topology, which you see here, is called an H-bridge because of how it looks like in the schematic. And instead of having discrete components, what you can use is 
modules like this or ICs like this, which already include the H bridge, which are rather easy to control, but which also include more protection or additional protection, which you don't have here in this very simple circuit. This is a DRV 8833 and it is rather cheap. And instead of having just one H bridge, this IC already two includes two H bridges. There is another kind of motor called the stepping or stepper motor. This is something like this. And you can recognize this because it has at least four cables. But the dead giveaway is when you turn on the shaft. If you turn on it, you will see that it only moves into steps and then it locks back in. This is where the name comes, stepping motor, because it advances into steps. And if you connect it to multimeters, what you can find is not just one coil, but two coils. And this is just as if there would be two motors inside this one motor. Since we found the two motors in the stepper motor, let's try to control them. For that, we will use the DRV8833, which two H bridges, and this way we can control them. Here are the buttons for that. The first button is to advance the first motor, so move forward. Second is second motor, advance second motor, then reverse first motor, reverse second motor. And to operate the stepper motor, you just go in sequence, one after the other. And every time I go to the next one, we can see that it advances by one step. So one of the advantages of the stepper motor is you can control the number of steps and revolutions. So you can go to a very, very precise position, even more precise than steps. You can go use micro, micro steps even. The second advantage is that when you press on a button, it holds the position with a lot of torque. So turning this shaft will be very, very hard because it holds the position. This is not something which is easy to do with normal DC motors. And this is the second reason why we would use stepper motors. There are also some dedicated IC especially for driving stepper motors like this DRV8825. Basically inside there are two H bridges but you don't have to provide the sequence yourself. It does it for you. So you just provide the direction and then every time you provide a pulse it moves forward by one step. So this eases, this makes it a bit more easy. It can do a bit more but that's the basic function. The advantage of this module also is that you can here set the maximum current for the stepper motor because even if you don't do any steps it will hold the shaft if you don't put it to sleep. So this lets limits the, the current. Now let's have a look at the electronics and we will start here with the battery. This is a lipo cell in the 18650 format, so quite standard. And I required this because we used this machine in the woods where we had no stable power. And the a USB power bank would not be strong enough to drive this motor. But this cell is strong enough and it is quite common. It also provides this provides power to this development board. This is the blue pill and my default very cheap microcontroller board which those most of the things. This uses an STM32 F103 microcontroller and it takes care of driving the motors but also implements the whole diffusing bomb game. The firmware is in here. It is connected to this DRV8833 motor driver. This is where the two H bridges are and they are connected with these four wires to the motor on the back for the syringe. Then we have also a proper stepper motor driver, the DRV. 8825 and this is connected with these four wires to this huge motor here. If we look at the connection, this stepper motor only requires four wires. This here connection has actually eight pins, but four of them are just looped, so in the end we also have only four wires. And we can control this way. What you cannot see is here on the back, we have all the connections, so we can see all the wires for all the connections. And most importantly, here, this module is a boost converter. The stepper motor driver needs at least five, uh, eight volts to drive this motor, but this only provides follow two volts. So we need this booster to boost the follow two volts to eight volts so we can drive this motor. And we can now try the board using the switch here on the side to start or to provide power we have four buttons on the side the two button on the top on the bottom are actually to set the position 
for the syringe and they drive the motor here on the back. The two buttons on the button on the top actually take care of driving this motor. And actually I needed button because I needed the right start conditions. I needed the right position for this motor and for this motor because once the game is completed, if you either lose or win, it only knows the exact amount of steps it needs to drive the motor to inject all the toxic poison or the right amount of steps to actually start the flamethrower and start the flame here but it doesn't need to it doesn't know the start position this still needs to be done manually now there's a second part of the electronics this is here the daughter board which is connected to the main board using this large ribbon cable and i had to use this connection because my prototyping box were too small but I also wanted to hide this part somewhere where it is inaccessible and where the user could cheat using the buttons here. So the player only had this board visible. What do we have here? First we have this seven segment display which displays the time to defuse the bomb and this uses a TM1637 chip which I've covered in a previous episode. We also have a buzzer to beep every time a second passes and to stress the player a bit. And then we have the 16 cables here and the four LEDs for the four puzzles. So each time a puzzle is solved, the LED will light up. Now the problem is that the microcontroller it was already connected to this driver, this driver, these four buttons, this display, the four LEDs and this buzzer. And I didn't have enough GPIOs to actually have the 16 wires connected directly to the microcontroller. Or in these cases, there are several solutions. You could use one of these boards. This is called a GPIO expander. You connect it to over I2C and then you have four more pins which you can read out over I2C. And you can chain them. So if you chain two of them, you have 16 pins. But these are a bit expensive. Uh, other solutions are something which are called parallel input serial output where you just clock the values of the 16 bits in parallel into a serial uh, stream of data but they didn't have any of these and but a very common and cheap solution is called multiplexing and i've explained it before and multiplexing 16 channels you only need eight wires because of the eight wires you have four times four which is equal to 16 but in this case, I use a 16 channel analog multiplexer and this took care of this. So here we have 8 pin inputs, or 8 pin, 4 pins input, S0 to S3. And these 4 bits allow us to select which of the 16 channel would be connected. And then this connection would be forwarded here as Z to the microcontroller. So every time using these 4 bits, you select the channel each after another and then you read out the value using Z. So by default when it is connected, it is connected to ground. So the microcontroller would be ground if the, connect, if the wire is not broken. As soon as the wire is broken, the signal is pulled up by the microcontroller and if the level is high it knows okay it is broken. And then do it very rapidly one after another. When you switch on, here the fast blinking which you see, this corresponds to actually every time selecting one channel and reading out one channel. Now it's time to play the game. So let's switch it on. And as soon as we switch it on, we see that the countdown has started. You now have 10 minutes to defuse the bomb. And to defuse it, you just need to cut the right cables. You also, so you see the countdown and you see also hear the buzzer beeping every second. So you have kind of a feedback for the time. Now, what happens if you cut the wrong cable? But instead of cutting, we will just unplug them because we just want to test it. We can see that the timer goes faster. It goes actually twice as fast. And you can also hear it in the buzzer, which does it indicates it's twice as fast. So it's like in a movie. It, it's fun. You all have more less time and it puts more pressure on you. Now, if we cut the wrong cable again, we see that it shows bad and it goes again twice as fast. Now, what happens if you cut the right cable? It's this one. We can see that the it shows good and the LED is on, meaning that you solved the first 
uh, the first challenge or the first puzzle and you have four or three other puzzles of three other wires to cut just one wire per puzzle because i know the solution let's just remove this wire so we see good we see the light then we have the black wire it's this one and so let's win the game by cutting this wire and if we win it it will say grill it will enable the torch and the torch will actually start grilling the nice piece of meat let's put the torch back because it's done and with that normally it's time you solve the challenge and you are rewarded with a nice really nice barbecue but let's do it let's also see what happens if you lose the game so let's just plug one wire back in and switch back the game on so we have 10 minutes and cut the wrong wire every time we see bad twice as fast bad again and because it's twice every time twice as much it grows exponentially bad so it goes really fast and you could lose the game pretty fast Tag bad bad and boom the bomb has exploded but instead of exploding what happens is that the motor presses on the syringe and this blue liquid which should be poisoned is injected into the meat so there's no nice barbecue for you because you failed this test now this blue thing isn't actually poison it's this this is kind of a liquid which you put in your mouth to find out where you should breath your teeth or how well you're breathing your teeth but I found it because it's I use that because it's a nice blue it stains really well and it was cheap it's fun and it's not toxic so you could actually eat the meat even if it has this inside it's not not too much of a problem and with that the game is over enjoy <laughs>